when the hurricane comes and washes away your entire infrastructure and all the roads and bridges, it does not wash away the debt that you took to build that very road and bridge that was washed away. How would you assess the work of the CDB post-COVID? More than, I suppose, a year and a half after you became president of this powerful regional institution. I think the, the work of the bank has continued uh, along the trajectory that it started, uh, namely to fulfill the mandate of the bank. And the mandate of the bank, if you recall, is one to promote the harmonious growth and development of the member countries and to foster, as it were, cooperation and integration among them in particular, mm -hmm. the least developed uh, members of the, of the group. So that, that mandate, in a sense, hasn't changed. But what has changed if I can uh, make the, the point of departure, since you asked for post-COVID, is where we were before COVID, where we are still within COVID, mm -hmm. and where we need to be in the future. And so when the editorial talks about choppy waters, I, I think they were referring to, in a sense, the, the magnification of the challenges that the region faces, if you want, starting from the, the structural legacy issues of development mm -hmm. that were intensified, as it were, by the impact of COVID. Mm -hmm. And if I dare ask post-COVID, mm -hmm. if I can use that phrase, mm -hmm. the whole Russia-Ukraine war, which, if you want, has added two more layers to those structural legacy issues that we talked about. And consequently, the work that needed to happen, the hard work and the creative thinking that you mentioned in your quote, means how do we get past this larger, more intense set of issues that the region faces. And so we have started, uh, is the way I would like to be able to put this, addressing those in at least uh, two dimensions. The first is how do you provide the, the, the thought leadership, which is the creative thinking that you refer to. How do we establish the new vision for where the region ought to be going, which is now how the bank can fulfill the mandate of getting to the growth and development of its members, because there has to be that particular link. Mm -hmm. And how do we help our countries weather the particular double, triple storm of structural COVID, Ukraine war, in the midst of a, let's call it now, vulnerability with regard to climate change, with regard to our smallness, uh, being, a, being a seed, and uh, getting past all of those in a way that is coherent over time. So we have been um, I would say very active in trying to pull all of this together, <laughs> establishing a framework that we can utilize and starting to implement that framework through our relationships, our engagement with the countries um, that are members of the bank. In the CDB strate strategic plan for 2020-24, mm -hmm. the bank highlighted what it described as the strangulation impact of debt on Caribbean economies. From where you sit as CDB president, do you have significant concerns about how Caribbean states have been managing their debts? And, and just pardon me for being a little parochial here, but how would you assess Jamaica's management of its debt with their country's debt to GDP ratio at the end of March um, being 94.2%, declining from 109.7% at the end of um, the previous year, that is March 2021? Yeah, I, I don't think we should um, zero in on uh, Jamaica because all countries, I think, across the region have uh, very high debt-to-GDP ratios. Um, and I 
I'd like us to maybe focus on a couple of elements of that. The first is mm -hmm. that debt is not something that exists um, at or during a, a short period. That essentially is an accumulation of various shortages where your expenditure needs are greater than your revenue potential. Um, and when countries accumulate debt, we should be looking at first two things, which is one, what was it spent on? And how much revenue are you capable of, of raising? And you, you said Jamaica was at 109% and going mm -hmm. down. Uh, yeah, but let's not forget it was much higher than that a well, few geez. years back. <laughs> and so rather than say it went from 109 to potentially 92 or whatever you number you look at, the, the question really is now shouldn't we equally be saying let's give Jamaica some credit for moving from 150, Indeed. 160 down to 90 over. So I, I don't think we should quibble on, on that point. Um, the, bigger, the bigger issue I think is and something that is not talked a lot about, which is we in the region mm -hmm. face vulnerabilities and get impacted by a number of natural hazards. Mm -hmm. Let's just call them hurricanes for yes, now. Yes. Um, a large part of it in terms of increased frequency and intensity now arising from the very climate change issues that mm -hmm. we are focused on. But the point that is typically missed, or at least not emphasized, mm -hmm. is when the hurricane comes and washes away your entire infrastructure and all the roads and bridges, it does not wash away the debt that you took to build that very road and bridge that was washed away to make it worse you now need to be borrowing more to be able to build, rebuild that bridge and road that was washed away by the storm. I remember where I started this, debt is an accumulation. So to the extent that you had a set amount of debt, let's say it was 50%, mm -hmm. and a hurricane comes, and because of the damage, your debt goes up to 60%. And by the time you even get out of this, another storm comes and your debt goes up to 80%. Now, do you think that this is bad debt out of your need to not even just grow, just simply recover, rebuild from those very natural events? And we have not done a, an appropriate study, I think, where we can say, what percentage of that debt that you refer to mm -hmm. is because of the impact of natural disasters that have nothing to do with policy. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the mistake we, we, we fall into a number of times mm -hmm. is we think countries in our space have high debt or high mm -hmm. debt ratios because of policy, uh, policy laxity or inappropriate policies. Now, I would be last to say no government <laughs> in the region has done bad policies. Now, I, I wouldn't say that, but I, I don't want to get stuck there because mm -hmm. I think there is adequate room to argue mm -hmm. that a lot of the debt that we face now is not necessarily because governments have done a poor job at managing but because of impacts outside of the control of governments that have forced them. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you another example, COVID. When COVID moved the debt ratio in the region mm -hmm. from 60% to about 80% over a two year period, would we argue that it was because governments did bad policy? But yet, the 80% now, that is the average, says these very governments cannot find room to borrow, to do the development that they need, mm 
because the debt ratios are deemed to be high, the risk is too high, or they are going to be on the borderline of debt sustainability. So I think these are some of the things we need to start thinking about before we start uh, passing judgment too quickly on how our government's doing. And as I say, it's not to excuse um, some missteps that may have occurred, neither is it to excuse the need for governments to still act appropriately mm -hmm. within the constraints that they have today. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. let's not judge the level of the debt to GDP purely on the basis that it is high. And by extension, it's because uh, governments made um, a host of, of mistakes. So I'm, I'm just arguing, let's temper, let's temper the judgment. Uh, maybe let's look a little closer at the decomposition of what these um, debt-to-GDP ratios are. Uh, and I haven't even talked about when an event occurs, the loss in income, the loss, when I say income, GDP, mm -hmm. that occurs coming out of that storm means you have a double whammy. The double whammy coming from, A, I need to increase debt to be able to rebuild, therefore my debt goes up. But my GDP now is going to take time, having fallen, mm -hmm. to get back to even where it was. And when I'm measuring, I'm measuring now a higher debt and a lower GDP, my ratio is going to jump uh, inordinately relative to if I was in a, a different space where my GDP was growing and my debt was growing. And I'm looking now at maybe even a stable debt to GDP ratio. So I'm just saying let's be a little um, cautious in jumping too quickly to attributions uh, based on the numbers. The numbers are the numbers. I'm not denying that. Uh, but there sometimes are a lot to unpack.